May we never take for granted the privilege that we have to come as God's children, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to worship our Heavenly Father. May He be very pleased with our worship today. Psalm 40, 1 and 2 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He reached down to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the mud, and He set my feet on a rock, making my footsteps firm.
Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every word, Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we want to know you more and more. We're hanging on every
And it came about when he had reclined at the table with them that he took the bread and blessed it and he broke it and began giving it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. i 
to direct our attention to the 11th chapter of the book of Isaiah, which will be the text for our morning message. And in this message, we're talking about Jesus as our hope. And this passage is a continuation of Isaiah's message to the people of his day with significant application for the people of any day. So we'll begin reading in verse 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth." He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious." Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your son, Jesus, who raised our lives up from the dead. For we who were dead in trespasses and sin have been made alive unto God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please speak to us now as we ask again in his name. Amen. So the title of the message this morning, Jesus is Our Hope. Hope is something that can be elusive, but it's also very essential. Where hope is absent, despair can settle in. Where hope is present, resilience can also be found. Hope in the faith sense is believing in and working toward an unseen future, which we believe God has planned and promised and will ultimately produce. It's also coming to terms with the biblical truth that the world that we now walk through, is, it only slightly resembles the planned community that believers will share when this age ends. In the 11th chapter of Isaiah, this wonderful servant of God 
reveals to a nation, his nation, the nation of Judah, and to her king, King Ahaz, that there is hope, and the hope that sustains is yet to come, and the hope that sustains that is yet to come is Jesus. Jesus is our hope. So today, along with Ahaz, I hope that we will learn that where hope is needed, that Christ is the answer. The penetrating presence of hope, whenever hope begins to make its way into our lives, the true penetrating presence of hope is located in the person of the Lord Jesus and nowhere else. All other hope will eventually and ultimately dissipate. It will disappear. It will be gone. But the hope that we find in Jesus is an eternally sustaining hope. Now, as we think about the world that we live in and the way that the world is, and we think about things that we tend to hope toward or that which we place our hope in, we realize that that the hopes that we have in this life really are suspect. They're not things that we can absolutely count on. But when we think about the hope that is present in the person of Jesus Christ, we find there a hope that we can absolutely rely on both in time and in eternity. Here in this passage of Scripture, what we see is Isaiah preaching a message of hope to a nation of people, to a nation of individuals that are facing some very difficult and dire times. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Suffice it to say that whenever he begins this message of hope, that he's pointing beyond the time in which they live to a day yet to come, to a day that we talked about a couple of Sundays ago in Isaiah chapter 7 and Isaiah chapter 9, whenever he spoke about the promised coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when he speaks about the ultimate hope that Judah can anticipate, he's speaking about something that will come, but maybe not even in their lifetime. Now that that sometimes is is something we struggle with. Because because we want to experience the fullness of hope in our day. And, And I want to tell you this morning that you can. You can experience the fullness of hope in your day. But you may not experience the ultimate realization of that hope in your day. The truth is that so many of us are earthly minded. We think about time and space as though it were the only realm that we'll ever occupy. But the fact is that all of Scripture points beyond time and space, beyond that realm, to a reality beyond time and space called eternity. It it points beyond the the nations and the kingdoms of this life, this earth, and points to a kingdom that Jesus said he came to introduce, to establish, to build, and to perpetuate. And and so everything that we think about in this life sometimes is a little bit too eye level. Whenever what God wants us to do is to look beyond this life and to realize, as so many of our old-time gospel songs remind us, that we're just passing through here. This is all temporary. It's only for a few minutes in the whole scheme of eternity as God sees it. So what we need to understand is that whenever Isaiah speaks to Ahaz and the people of Judah in his day, he's offering them hope in Jesus Christ. And so he's he's telling them, you need to look ahead. You need to look forward to what God is ultimately going to do to redeem his people through his son that will be born. So in this particular instance, we see this nation that is in the throes of difficulty and challenge. And and again, I'll explain what that's all about here in a moment. But what happens is that Isaiah then brings this, this idea of Jesus to them and says, here's your hope. So what we see are there three things I want to share with you. The first one is this. The promise of Christ introduces hope in the midst of despair. This nation is, 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 is in, uh, on the downturn of hope. They're moving quickly into a place that we might call despair. And, and so in order to understand this, I want us to consider today the historical situation in which Isaiah is preaching. Now, let's think about where we've been in this book. Whenever you begin 
the, the, the first part of the story with Isaiah speaking, he's speaking about the, the time of the reign of Uzziah, who was the king of Judah at that particular point. Now, whenever Isaiah was a young man, he observed his nation rising to a level of prosperity and success that had not been known since the time of King Solomon. Whenever Solomon was ruling and reigning, the nation was the wealthiest and most powerful nation on the earth. But at this particular time, they had gone through all these movements of decline. And, and, and now under Uzziah's reign, he reigned for a number of years. The nation had really built back to a place of prosperity and success. They had walls that were strong and towers and fortifications. They had a large standing army. They actually had a port that they had built for commerce on the Red Sea, which was far south of their borders. All these things had been something that had happened under the reign of Uzziah. They also had increased trade. They had tribute that was being paid to them from other nations. They had success in war with the Philistines and the Arabians. All these things because of Uzziah's capable and adept leadership. But along with the wealth and power, something else began to grow in that nation. The, the sense of avarice, greed, entitlement... All these different things began to, to grip the minds and the hearts of these people until they began to think that they were who they were because of who they were. Sound familiar? So along with the wealth and the power came the avarice, the greed, and then following that, there was the oppression of the upper class by the lower class. There was religious formality in which the worship of God just became something that was sort of a box to check. And corruption began to creep in at every level of leadership. So Uzziah dies. And then there's another king that takes place, his son, a man named Jotham. And then following him, there's a man named Ahaz. Ahaz is, is ruling and leading at this particular point when Isaiah brings this message. So following Uzziah's death, the Assyrians saw an opening and felt like they could move in and, and so they begin to rise up and to manifest their lust for conquest. And, and when Ahaz be, had become king, in order to keep Assyria from conquering Judah, he made an alliance with her king. And he actually began to pay tribute to them, whereas Judah had been receiving tribute from other nations. And he even had a copy of the Syrian altar set up in the temple of God in, in place of the brazen altar of Solomon. And so in the midst of this once mighty nation, now reduced to cowardly fear and even paying tribute for protection, in the midst of what is now a godless people whose very heritage was explained in terms of Jehovah's goodness to them, there walked a man with a message. This man's name was Isaiah. And Isaiah, this marvelous servant of God, this man from whom we learn and gain so much insight, and awareness into God's plan of the ages. He walks among this people, and he begins to preach something to them. When they see the collapse of their nation occurring before their eyes, he begins to preach a message of hope. He explained that this hope would come through the bloodline of a man named Jesse. Jesse was the father, of course, of David. And this is what he told them. He says, even though you have forgotten God, God has not forgotten you. That's a good word. That's a good word. I want you to know that wherever we are as individuals, wherever we might be as a church or wherever we might be as a nation, that even if in some sense of our, of our journey of faith we may have forgotten God or pushed Him aside, I want you to know that God has not forgotten us. God is still very keenly aware of every aspect of who we are and what we're about. And so what God is saying through this wonderful preacher, this man named Isaiah, is this. Even though the once proud tree of the Davidic kingdom has been reduced to nothing more than a stump, even though the kingdom which once powerfully displayed life before everyone and, and it had become like a mighty tree destroyed by a bolt of lightning, the tree itself may have fallen, but he says, from the root remains... And from the root, from this stump, a young green sapling, a tender shoot 
will rise up. This stump that, is once, that was once vigorous is going to produce something. In other words, this nation that God had called to himself years and years and centuries earlier was not forgotten by God, and God was still intending to use that nation to produce the essence of hope that would encompass the entire universe. From the house of David, he says, from the house of David, out of Jesse, there will be a, a root that will rise, a, a, a shoot that will rise up out of that stump. And this twig would grow and it would produce fruit. And the fruit that it would produce would be great. And it would ultimately result in the humiliation of the nations that were rising up against Judah. But it would also result in a kingdom that was perfect in every way. Now I want to tell you something. This prophetic message that was delivered by Isaiah to the people of his day still has yet to come to completion. As he speaks to Isaiah, as he speaks to Judah and his people about a nation, a kingdom that God is building, that God is establishing, that God is introducing through Jesus. He's talking about a kingdom in which Jesus will reign in righteousness. I want to tell you that that has not yet come to fruition. It, it, it's, it's among us. It's permeating. It's here and it's there, but it's not established in its entirety. And so what we see is that, that as, as God speaks through Isaiah, he promises something to Ahaz, and this is what he promises. He says, you can expect that God is going to use you in a specific way to produce what will become ultimately the answer and the message of hope for the entire world. So this abysmal decline that was happening under Ahaz's regime this alliance with Syria, the inclusion of foreign gods, all the different things that were taking place, Isaiah says to him, take heart. Even though you're moving in wrong directions, God is still going to use you, and the promise of relief that God is providing is going to come from the very bloodline of Ahaz himself. So, we find here a word of promise from God. We see that there's a kingdom that's established in that day, the day that, that Isaiah preaches and that kingdom is a kingdom that has made alliances that are unhealthy and unholy. It's a kingdom that has prostituted itself to the culture and to the world. It's a kingdom that says, we are walking on this planet, so we're going to be like this planet. The culture has begun to mirror. The culture of the people of God has begun to mirror the culture of the paganistic world around it. It's a problem. And so what Isaiah is doing is he's here to introduce a kingdom yet to come. And what he's going to say to the people is this. You can choose to let your life mirror the culture of the kingdom of this earth. Or you can choose to let your life mirror the kingdom that Christ is coming to establish. And it's a choice that you have to make. No one can make it for you. So... There's hope in the person of Jesus, but you have to align yourself and ally yourself with him in order for that hope to take root in your own life. What we see here is something that is very akin to the human experience. Think about it. It's very parallel. We, we walk through life and what we see, we see highs and we see lows. We see ups and we see downs. That's the way the nation of Judah had been under Uzziah. They were up. They were high. But now under Ahaz, they've gone over the brink. And they're, they're moving quickly into the place of despair. Life is filled with obstacles. It's also filled with opportunities. See, few of us live such charmed lives that hope is something that's never needed. Many of us face life with wonderful experiences much of the time. I'll grant that. But then the catastrophes of life hit and we find ourselves careening headlong into the pit of despair. The seismic shift that occurs whenever the troubles of life meet the fault lines of our existence bring us into a place where hope is essential. And if we don't have it, if we don't have hope, the result is despair. That's where this nation was moving. That's where people go without Christ. They move along that continuum until ultimately there is no hope. There's no hope, only despair. But I want to tell you this morning that wherever you are, 
in that sequence of life that the promise of Christ introduces hope in the midst of despair. That's what he is about. He's about a promise of something that you can cling to, that you can hope in, that you can trust in, that you can believe in, that will not be shaken. Jesus Christ. He is our hope. So the promise of Christ talks about hope in the midst of despair. The presence of Christ brings order in the midst of chaos. I want you to look at what he begins to say about this shoot that will rise up in verse number 2. He speaks about first his character. He says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now I want you to think about that first phrase for a moment. It says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Interesting choice of words, wouldn't you say? The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The idea of rest is something that every one of us find appealing, right? I mean, how many of you like to rest? I mean, wake up and I'm talking to you. <laughs> Just kidding you. Because I know you sang a song a while ago that said, when the Spirit speaks, you're on the edge of your seat, and I know you are, so Theoretically. But we like the idea of rest. Well, what the idea of rest means that is that it suggests to us that everything is well. Everything's okay. When we're at rest, we, we're at a place of peace and, 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 and solitude and quietness, and, and everything is okay. There's no conflict. So think about this. The Spirit of God, it says, will rest upon him. In other words, when the Spirit of God settles upon the person that God is raising up, the, the, the person Jesus, that there will be no conflict between him and the Spirit. Now, I want you to think about your own life for a moment. And I want you to think about when the Spirit of God begins to visit you. Quite often, whenever we're walking with God the way that we should, we can say, I and the Spirit of God are at rest with each other. But I want to tell you something. There are those times in my life, whenever my mind starts to get off track, my heart starts to stray, I start to move away from what God intends for me. And at that point, I can tell you right now, the Spirit of God is not at rest <laughs> upon my life. No, He begins to probe and He begins to gouge. He begins to stir. He begins to convict. He begins to correct. But that never happens with the one that God sends, the, God, the King that God raises up, His Son, the Lord Jesus. No, the Spirit is at rest upon Him. There's never a moment of disagreement. There's never a moment of conflict between the Spirit of God and the Messiah because they're actually one. So he speaks about the Spirit of God being at rest, but then he begins to talk about the way the Spirit will manifest through him. Look at what he says. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. What does that mean to us? Well, when he speaks about the spirit of wisdom, he's talking about the fact that he will discern the ways and will of God. When he speaks about counsel, he says that he has the ability to guide and to write decisions and to help in the formation of right conclusions. When he speaks about might, he's saying that he's strong and courage and valor and that he's able to withstand whatever comes against him that, that, that doesn't see things the way that he does. When he speaks about the spirit of knowledge, he's saying that he has the handle on the truth. When he speaks about the fear of the Lord, he's saying that he has this sincere desire to affirm that God is the sovereign king and that beside him there's no other. And so in the life of Jesus, when he comes, we have the privilege of reading into his life and to see what Scripture says about the way that he walked this journey. And everything that Isaiah promised about him proves to be true in the way that he manifested himself. If you don't believe it, read the Gospels. Everything that Isaiah says about him is verified countless times in the Gospels. So the Spirit of the Lord rests upon him. His character is impeccable. But then he talks about his kingdom his governance. He says, with righteousness he'll judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. 
He says that he is going to rule and reign in righteousness and equity and that everything that he does will be just and fair and right for everybody who's concerned. And the right and the, the rightness and the fairness and the equity with which, which he judges will include the affirmation of that which is good and the judgment of that which is not. He says this is the way he's going to be. He says you can trust in his governance because he's going to judge in righteousness and justice. Then he describes his realm. Look in verse number 6. He says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. The little child shall lead them, the cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. The ox and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Uh, the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Here he's talking about a reality in which all is peace. Everything is set right. And I want to tell you that we are not there. We are not in that reality. That reality has yet to be seen. And, and so if you flip over and you begin to read in the book of Revelation, you'll read about the fact that Jesus is going to come again in righteousness, and he's going to establish his kingdom. He's going to set up his reign. There's a word that's used to describe it. Some people deny its presence or its reality, but it's called the millennium. It's the time whenever Jesus will set up his reign in, his right, in, in righteousness, and he'll rule for a thousand years. And during that time, the things that are talked about here, the things that are spoken about here, will become the reality where Jesus is reigning in righteousness and justice, and where all is set right in the earth, where the conflict and the, the, the wildness and the ferocity of even the wildest of animals will be overcome by the presence of the peace and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's speaking about something yet to come. Now what Isaiah's doing is he speaks to the people of his day as he's saying this, you're in a kingdom right now that's in turmoil and, and, and you're in a kingdom right now that's in a mess. Can I get an amen? amen. We know what that's like. We're walking through a world that is uncertain. And I'm not a prophet of doom. I'm surely not. But I'm telling you, you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, and I don't either. And, and so we, we face the uncertainty of a world that's in a mess. And what Isaiah says to the people who face the uncertainty of a world that's in a mess in their day is this. There's going to come a day. And the day that's coming is the day whenever Jesus Christ will establish his throne. And he will reign in righteousness. He will rule with justice and equity. And in that day, there's going to be peace on earth and goodwill among men. So he promises, he's talking about the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus. And he says, In that day they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So his realm is described. Peace among those who were once hostile. Everything is set right. Safety where there was once danger. So the, the promise of Christ, the promise of Christ comes to us with hope instead of despair. The presence of Christ brings order where there is chaos. And that's true in your own life as well. If your life is filled with turmoil and chaos, trust in Jesus and he will settle your life down. But you have to trust Him. The third thing I want to share with you is this. The purpose of Christ includes restoration in the midst of desolation. The, the land that Isaiah is preaching to is a land that's about to go into this, this mode of desolation. You can read in the prophecies of Isaiah as we've been studying some on Wednesday nights. And he's talking about a time whenever the jackals will inhabit the houses where people once lived. It's going to be desolate. But I want you to know that he promises Christ as the answer to that. And look at what he says. He says in verse number 10, In that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner, an ensign, a flag, a, a, a rally. 
And what's going to happen is that he'll stand as a banner to the people. The people he's speaking about, there are the Jewish people, the, the folks who are the people of God. But he also says the Gentiles will seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. And if you go on and read in verse 11, it says, It'll come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt and Pathros and Cush, Elam and Shinar, Hamath and the islands of the sea. And he will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The purpose of Christ includes restoration in the midst of desolation. And this is, has two, two aspects that I want to mention to you. First of all, he speaks about in this restoration, this recovery, that the people that he calls to himself will be a unified people that Gentile and Jew alike, that all the nations will come together around him and that they'll find in him their place and their point of unification. That, that, that there will not be all of these human designations that set us apart, but that we'll find ourselves one in him. So it's a unified people because, according to verse 11, it's a redeemed people. It's a people that he has called to himself and to, who believe on his name and trust in him to make their lives right in the sight of God and to settle in their life that he is the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. The king of this kingdom is Jesus. And I want to tell you about this king and this kingdom. He is now building this kingdom that he, has, that he introduced when he came to this earth the first time. The same kingdom is here foretold by Isaiah as he prophesied that this stump would produce a branch that would be the king in this kingdom and that this Israel that was soon to be desolate, from that nation this branch would come and it would spring forth. And Jesus would be the hope for everyone. Right now the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world stand in stark contrast to each other. Right now, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God stand in constant conflict to each other. And so Jesus moves through this earth in the presence of his Holy Spirit, and this is what he says to people. Which kingdom do you align with? Which kingdom do you identify with? Are you more closely aligned to the kingdom of this world? Does your life more closely resemble the culture of the world that you're walking through than it does the kingdom of God? Or will you choose in your heart of hearts to align with the kingdom of God and to let the kingdom of God and its charter determine your conduct, your character, the whole of your belief? It's a strong charge from Isaiah. Because that's, that's what he's telling the people. There's a kingdom that you can align with that's not going to careen over the precipice of corruption and brokenness. It's the kingdom of God that will stand forever. <laughs> Daniel talks about it when he speaks about all the different kingdoms that are going to come. And he says there's going to come a, a stone, a, a rock that will be coming down and it's going to, to mow down all these other kingdoms. And it's going to be established and it's going to going to stay forever and forever. So which kingdom do you want to be a part of? Which kingdom do you want to identify with? Which kingdom would you say your life now presents as your citizenship? Are you more aligned with the kingdom of this world or are you more aligned with the kingdom of Christ? I want to tell you something, folks. This world that we're in right now there are a lot of question marks across the face of it. And the need for hope within humanity is profound. The world needs hope. But like the people of Isaiah's day, they need someone to articulate that hope to them. That would be the church. That would be you and that would be me. Truth is that the cyclical nature of life ultimately brings us to a place where in our own lives hope is essential. If you haven't been there, just hang on. You'll be there at a place where you need hope. And, and, and if you haven't discovered it, you will hopefully discover then that the 
the, the place where that hope is found is only in the person of the Lord Jesus. So the only source of hope that will sustain in time and eternity is Jesus. If you're here this morning and you have not placed your faith and your trust in Him, I want to tell you that Jesus is your only hope. He's the only hope that will sustain, that will outlast the changing courses of this life. Jesus is your hope. Will you trust Him today? Will you crown Him King in your own heart and identify with His kingdom as the only kingdom that will remain? Will you trust Jesus today? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, please. In just a moment, we're going to have an opportunity for everyone in this room and beyond to think carefully about your life, to think carefully about the footsteps that you make every day on the path of your choosing. And we're going to give you the opportunity to identify in your own heart which kingdom am I serving? Which kingdom does it appear that my citizenship is most closely aligned with? And, and, if, and if it's not the kingdom of God, then I want to ask you this morning to ask God by His Spirit to give you the grace to transfer your citizenship from the kingdom of this earth to the kingdom of God. And to live as though you're a citizen of that kingdom that He Himself came to establish. Maybe that means for you that you just need to be saved. You need that initial experience with Christ where you trust Him as your Savior. You, you ask Him to forgive you for your sin. You believe on Him unto eternal life. You follow Him from this point forward. Maybe for others of you who have done that, this is a call from Christ to your own heart to examine your life and to see if you haven't somehow regressed and stepped back from the call of God's kingdom and answered instead the call of this world. And today it's time for you just to say, Lord, please forgive me. Oh, please forgive me. I, I need to be walking in the kingdom that is yours. Please forgive me. And, and, and please use me. Let me be aligned with your purposes and your plan. Let me trust in you. Maybe God's leading you to some other decision. I want you to know that in just a moment, I'm going to invite our ministerial staff to move down to the front to be there for you if you need to have someone to pray with you or to guide you. Maybe, maybe today's the day of salvation for you and you just need some help with that. These gentlemen would be happy, overjoyed to walk you through that process to help you know how you can know Jesus. Maybe today's the day that you just need to redirect your life to repent of backing away from the things of God and to come closer to Him. We'd be happy to pray with you in those kinds of situations as well. Maybe this is God's invitation for you to come unite with this church family or to begin that process, and we'd be happy to speak with you about that. Whatever God's asking, whatever God's asking, I'm going to ask you just to stand as I pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come today with heads bowed, with hearts bowed before you, asking that you would find in us people willing to hear the words of God, to respond with every aspect of our willing obedience to you, whatever that may mean. As the music plays, if you need to come, you come. Our, our men are waiting down front for you. You come now. Whatever decision God's leading, you come. You make that decision clear today. You come.